Well, hello. Hello there, PJ. How are you today? I'm well. I am well. I'm well. Um, so Florida's in a bit of a flux, huh? You got hurricanes, alligators, and wild monkeys out in Orange City. Oh, my. That's right. There is actually a, uh, well, in addition to the hurricane that's uh, coming our way. And uh, after this episode, I am seriously thinking about getting in my car and getting out of here. Although I'm, I'm not exactly in harm's way, but these things have a tendency to uh, to veer a little off course and, uh, you know, 30 mile correction and and I'll be living in a tent. Yeah. Don't so uh, hopefully that won't happen. Uh, but yeah, I just, uh, you know, I just, I just, I just heard that there's a wild monkey uh, running rampant through uh, Orange City, Florida. And it's not just any monkey. And, and I, I dedicate uh, the name of this monkey to two people. Uh, Mr. Miller, who was my science teacher in ninth and 10th grade, and to my friend Aaron Brickman, who will, and the other members of that class, because I'm going to name the monkey. Uh, and I'm saying that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a little I'm a little nervous about doing that. But but as you said, PJ, that is the, the real name of the monkey. And I think I should just... Proper name. It's the proper name. So, so this monkey is the wild macaque, and um, and I'll just stop right there. I'll just stop right there. This is this is a much deeper uh, beginning than I thought. Um, obviously, you have some pain you want to unpack about your science teacher. I get that. To the uh, contrary, he, he, you know what? He was my favorite teacher, and in a crazy story, years and years later, um, I'm visiting the same school that I went to. It was a it was a, a K through twelve school. Uh, Mr. Miller is now in his seventies, but still teaching. And, uh, and I, you know, I graduated in 91. So this, this was in 2017, maybe. Um, and I'm there with my son and, um, we're visiting the school because we just moved back to Maryland. We're thinking about potentially uh, having a go to the school and we're looking into a classroom and it turns out Mr. Miller's teaching it. And he comes out and he remembered me. I mean, this is a man that's been teaching 40 years. Sure. And is a legend at the school. And he 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 immediately said my name. He gave me a big hug. It was uh, probably my favorite teacher of all time, Mr. Miller. I hope you're listening. I appreciate all you did for me, and that you introduced me to uh, the wild Japanese macaque. I'm just I'm just saying. I'm you know don't shoot the messenger. It just sounds wrong when you say that. So it does, uh, doesn't it? We are we are today thrilled because we also have Pete on the podcast with us and pete just so you know my son's name is pete so hopefully it's a I good don't, name it, it's a <laughs> wonderful name I, hopefully i don't come across too fatherly like pete <laughs> right, so. clean your room yeah, what, is exactly. the, what does the p and pj stand for i don't think i've ever asked you that peter so peter okay yes, well there you go the well you could be talking to yourself i like <laughs> looking in the mirror i do i talk to myself and then i get in arguments with myself and then i give myself the silent treatment so um there we have it. So we have to <laughs> Pete Moores and Pete is actually online with us from London and from London to Singapore to North America and to 20 countries overall. Pete has spent the past two decades empowering hundreds of startups to unleash million and billion dollar science and technology companies working at the intersection between science, business, funding, mentoring and coaching. Pete has designed and run technology accelerator programs for founders, developing genuine new to the world innovations, and currently works to help companies solve the problems that prevent them from getting market engagement and interest from investors. Pete, it is an honor to have you on with us on the Braving Business Podcast. Well, thank you both for having me. It's a delight. Yeah. Are you uh, are you actually in London? Yeah, I'm just outside London in a little place called Twickenham, where England play rugby. Nice. Oh, okay. Are, are you a football fan by any chance? And by football, I mean football. You know, not oh, you mean American like American football. I mean football. Soccer. Let's just leave okay. it at that. Don't even use <laughs> yeah. that S word, please. I had no choice. My my uh -huh. grandmother knitted me a Manchester United scarf when I was six years old. Oh. So, as my family is from Manchester, that's I'm a, I'm a Manchester Red all through and through, and so are my well, son. Have you know? I'll have you know that I live in Tampa Bay, and uh, we we share the same owner. The Glaziers own the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, um, yes. and they also own Manchester United, at least for now. So the much maligned, yeah, the much maligned Glazers. Yeah. I, I, you know, I know them not well, not well. Uh, a friend of mine is a good friend of Brian Glazier, and uh, and I was once at a bar mitzvah with uh, Brian Glazier. That's uh, that's the extent. Yeah. I saw him from across the room. We crossed eyes. No, we didn't. But we it would have been nice if we had crossed eyes. Yeah. 
Um, Pete, it's a pleasure to have you here. I, I, I appreciate you uh, taking time out of your busy schedule, and it's also uh, getting later in the day for you. Um, and I'm I'm really excited to have you here because for for a number of reasons. One, um, you know, you're involved in some things that entrepreneurs often hear about, like accelerator programs. But but as a matter of fact, very very uh, a very small percentage of startups actually participate in accelerator programs. So it's one of these things where people hear about it, they don't quite understand it, and you know, uh, I'm hoping you can share some insights with our audience about what the heck that means and um, maybe maybe some tidbits of of uh, of what's gained in accelerator programs. But let's actually start with you because you, you've lived a fascinating life and um, and it starts with, uh, well, it doesn't start with, it wasn't the first thing that happened in your life, but the first mm-hmm. thing that uh, that we're going to talk about is is something that happened to you uh, that really changed your life. You were involved as a cyclist in a 50 miles per hour accident. That sounds incredible. I don't know how you survived that. Um, and that accident changed the course of your life. Um, tell our audience about that. Yeah, it certainly did. This was uh, starting New Year's 2020 with a bang, quite literally. So I was out for a nice bike ride, you know, New Year, health regime, starting the New Year right. And, uh, you know, a 20 mile circuit I've done 100 times and then hit from behind by a, a 91 year old driver at 50 miles an hour. So I left a lovely, great big dent on the side of his car with my head. So I am very lucky you know, to still be here, thanks to my cycle helmet. And even though I broke my back, my uh, pelvis, ribs, knee, shoulder, I'm very lucky that everything recovered with just no surgery, with just pain relief and physiotherapy over the long term, over 2020. So I started, uh, at the time I was employed by a global innovation consulting company, and that span out from Oxford University. And obviously being injured and working for a global company just before the pandemic hit was not the greatest of timing. So I went through the ringer of you know of redundancy from that company and had a lot of time during my recovery to think about what really, what my passion was, what really inspired me. And I came to the conclusion it's always been that science and technology, or my role in helping science and technology make real world impact make a real difference in the world, solve the problems that there are in the world, not just create scientific publications that sit on shelves and create dust. And I had a lot of time to think about how I wanted to do that. And it was in talking with a group of my sort of friends and and mentors that persuaded them, persuaded me to take the sort of self-employment route and start my own company. Because one of the things I've, well, many of the things I've learned over the past 20 years is how kind of broken the current setup for building an innovative company really is everything stacked in favor of the people who have the money you know, they have all the power and you have none of their money and looking at the way that the system works thought there's, there's room here for a different way of building science and technology companies avoiding some of the the key mistakes that many companies make and doing it in a much more consultative building with the market way not just doing what um, Kevin Costner did in Field of Dreams to build something and hope that they come. Because in in the innovation world- But but he looked so cute doing that. That's that's one of my favorite movies. I I love how, you know, it's it's a very romantic movie. That's all I got to say. But sadly, it doesn't work too well for science. It doesn't work in business. I would agree with that. Yeah. So yeah, so I start, I worked, I've been working ever since with a large public sector consulting company and uh, a number of universities where I sort of helped them embed this culture of commercialization, making more of a difference in the world from scientific research. But the, the sector that I'm most, most passionate about is the early stage startup world in which you know, nine out of 10 companies typically don't make it. And from applying the, sort of the, a lot of the learnings that I've developed over the years, I believe I can help overcome that and build better and bigger and more successful companies. What would you say really quick, what, what would you say are the two or three most common reasons that companies don't make it, those yeah. startups? Yeah, well, the, 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 the overarching one is that they run out of money before they've established enough traction in the market to prove that they're onto a good thing. And they try and go to the, the sources of funding investors at too early a stage where they haven't got that sort of level of traction and interest from the market. And when you do that, you're kind of like going to an investor and saying, give me some of your money and I'll go and, so we can go and prove that this is a good idea. 
you know, and gambling with somebody else's money on the strength of your idea is not a very viable proposition. So <laughs> the, you know, the number one um, advice that I always give is don't chase that money, chase the market, you know, find that thing that people really want from you that addresses their needs, addresses a big enough problem and chase that until you've got it. And it's, and people are begging for it and it's flying off the shelves faster than you can make it. Then go to investors. Save yourself the pain. Well, that sounds easy, but what if you don't have the money to build a product? I mean, I, not, I, I don't disagree with you in mm. theory. I think, I think practically that depending, of course, on what you're manufacturing or producing or selling, mm. uh, practicality comes into play. But I, I am, I'm getting in PJ's way because he is chopping at the bit to ask a question. Go ahead, PJ. I can see it on your face. <laughs> Uh, where are we? No. So, um, <laughs> Pete, I, I wanted to ask about, you're talking about engagement, you're talking about engaging the market. So what are some ways that you think engaging the market is the most practical way? But uh, I, you know, we, we've all, we are all entrepreneurs here. Um, I created a company, uh, before that made custom blue jeans. And so I would just go out and talk to people. And while I was flying around the world on my regular job, I would talk to people about, Hey, how do you like those jeans? What's wrong with them? What's, you know, what's, what's right with them? What's wrong with them? And just strike up conversations. And, and that's when I started hypothesizing, well, what if we were able to do this? What if we were able to do that? And then come up with my own kind of high concept idea on uh, how that would work in the market. So I had mm. three orders before I, I even had anything to show anybody. Right. So people are like, if you can do this, I want them. I'm like, okay. yeah, is that, is, is that what you mean in regards to engaging the market? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the way that, you know, many digital companies build their business, you know, they put out a landing page you know, based around the problem that they're solving to attract people into their world. So you're telling the world, not about what you've got market validation, isn't going out there and speaking to people and saying, Hey, look what I've got. What do you think of it? Because that's just people being nice to you. But if you're engaging with them on, you know, I am, I'm here to solve this particular problem and you're talking to them about whether that problem is the right one for them. And that's a, a burning problem to which there aren't good solutions out there at the moment. Those are the sorts of conversations you can have with people that indicate there's a real need for something in this area. And you're absolutely right. You build on those conversations with early um, stage potential would-be customers to get those pre-orders, to get that level of interest, because the more of that you've got, you know, the more, um, the more weight, the more substance you're going to have when you do approach investors, even if that's, you know, grant funders at the early stage or crowdfunding, if you've got something that you know, has a really big you know, sort of consumer pr product. And there are, you know, many other ways to get funding at the early stages rather than sort of jumping straight into bed with early stage venture capital investors. Yeah. And and also, I think that it's important because as an entrepreneur, you are the top evangelist, evangelist, mm. evangelist. Oh my God, yeah. I can't speak today. You're the top evangelist, right? And so having those conversations with people that you know, but especially the people that you don't know and working out the concepts, I think just makes you a better evangelist down the line when you mm -hmm. actually do go and try to get funding from people who, you know, are going to either make or break your company at that point, you got to be able to sell it. You have to be able to talk about it, um, you know, with a lot of purpose and drive and passion and, mm -hmm. and background. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the sort of the marketing theory, you know, it comes from you know, uh, the book by Simon Sinek called Starting With Why. You know, all the, all the good companies, take Apple as an example, they don't tell the world about, you know, their latest product and how it works and how all the specifications of it all. You know, their Apple's groundbreaking marketing was based on the slogan, think different. They're advertising people to people who also want to think the same way that, that they do. You know, you're trying to bring in a crowd of people that see things the way that you do, because that's your crowd, that's your market. Rather than trying to sort of hammer home, he's, this is the features and benefits of my products. Hammer that home to, to to try and convert people. You're much better to tell the world about why your company exists, the reason, the purpose behind it, the problem you're trying to solve, and bring people into your world at that early stage. Pete, I, I, as I hear you, and it's not that I disagree, but I'm going to challenge you, and I'm going to challenge you hard on a lot of what right. you said. So first, of course, we can talk about Apple. Let's go talk about Amazon. Let's go talk about, you know, 
uh, Google. I mean, those companies can shape the world and have the power and the capital to be perceived as they want to be perceived. They can manage their public relations, given their their size, their their market domination, uh, their ubiquity, uh, in ways that ordinary, particularly startup businesses, cannot. So um, it's not that I disagree with the premise. I just don't, I'm not sure I'm following how that applies to a startup. So help mm. me understand, I mean, you're a startup and you're talking about not even a venture backed startup. So you're talking, let's say you're a startup, you're maybe, you know, you broke the piggy bank, you have 10, 15, 20, $25,000, maybe a little bit more, maybe you raise the friends and family around, you have a hundred grand, you're starting a new business. Help me understand how you apply what you just said, because I'm not, I'm not sure mm. that I would know how, and you know what, obviously that's what you, you, you've been doing it for, for a long time and have helped a lot of companies. So I'm sure there is a way I'm not currently, it's, it's not as clear to me at this juncture, what that mm. way is. So help us understand that. Sure. I suppose the central principle you have to apply from that kind of Apple uh, story is not to go out to the world and talk about the product that you've got. Talk about the thing that you've invented or are going to invent, but instead talk about the problem in the world that it solves. And you know, nearly all of the companies that I work for, you, know, you can break down what their product does in terms of how it solves a particular problem for a particular group of people. And you're advertising to them and engaging with them, whether that's through social media marketing, whether that's through LinkedIn, whether it's through going out there and talking to people at events, not talking about the product that you've got, how it works, its features and benefits, but instead talking about the, the problem that it solved in the world. So I guess that's the central thing that you take from the Apple kind of case study. It's not that you have to have a multi-billion marketing budget to do it. It's just that you have to talk about why your company exists, the purpose behind it, the reason why it gets you out of bed in the morning and the people that you want to help rather than you know, this clever new thing that you've invented. I get that. And, you know, we had a guest, uh, you know, earlier uh, by the name of uh, Sakshi Srivastava, who's who's uh, who's uh, legally blind and is is uh, founded a company along with her husband and some other people that is bringing wearable uh, wearable AI to people with that uh, lack vision so that they can be more independent. And she talks about the problem. So I, I get that. I think I get that a lot. I, I understand where you're going with that. Um, I guess my challenge is, uh, and not that I think that uh, it's uh, the fact that there is a challenge means that, that, that the premise is, is not valid, uh, but how do you break through, right? So, I mean, I, I'm an entrepreneur. I have a new company. I, 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 I have absolutely identified the problem. You're talking about, you know, you say, you've said multiple times now, tell the world. That assumes the world's listening. So, uh, and by the way, and I know that you've done an incredible job. Uh, you 10 x your numbers, uh, your number of followers in just two years on LinkedIn. So you obviously know how to break through. And this is a very loud and noisy world we live in. Mm. what is the answer? I mean, you know, I mean, unless you've got the capital to plow against breaking through, how do you get heard by quote unquote, the world or, or the sub segment of the world that you're trying to communicate to? Yeah. Well, I guess the, the first thing to do is to be absolutely crystal clear about who your ideal customer is and start with them. So you don't have to take over the world. You don't have to have big marketing budgets and run expensive campaigns. You have to get good at identifying and connecting with on a person-to-person -person level with your ideal customer. So whether you use LinkedIn to find them, whether you start conversations organically, whether you find them at trade shows, whether you just hunt them down on the particular social media network that they belong on, the key thing is to get a handful of those to have those important early stage conversations, as PJ was saying, to sort of validate you know, whether you're onto a good thing at the earliest possible stage. Also, I think uh, story, right? You have to, you mm -hmm. have to create, uh, if you don't mind me piping in on this, you, you, I think you really have to create a compelling story because that's what, at the end of the day, the, the mark that you leave when you tell that story is, is going to lead you down either a path of further engagement or not. And if you can create a compelling story, if you can create, you know, really honing in on that why and the problem and what you're trying to address. I think that um, as long as your story is top notch, you'll get p people to listen, hopefully. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly believe in the power of, of a story. And, it, and again, 
when you when you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and tech founders about the story, you get a sort of a condensed chronological history of everything they've done to take you up to that point. And that's not what a story is all about, what not what a compelling story is all about. You know, it should be that compelling story that gives the listener a reason to care about why you're doing what you're doing, a reason to engage further. It's got to tell the, the world a little bit about what your, your what it is and what you've got. But ultimately, it should be positioning yourself as the best place in the world to solve this particular problem. And why it matters to them. And why it matters to them, absolutely. Because without that connection, without them understanding why it matters to them, you know, it's just another pitch in the you know thousands of pitches that an investor will hear every year. So let's talk about, and and I think that's a super valid point, and and uh, and and a lot of entrepreneurs uh, get this wrong. I think on the front side, they fall in love with a mousetrap of some kind, mm. and uh, and the focus tends to be on the mechanics of the mousetrap and not the problem it solves. And so I think that's a super valid point. Um, I, I want to shift and, and talk a little bit about mindset. And uh, mm. I was, you know, in our pre-interview, um, you shared some some really powerful things about your approach to your own mindset. And I, I would imagine that as you coach and you mentor uh, that this comes into play. You talked about the extent to which self-awareness plays a meaningful role in your life. You talked about five pillars for what you call for optimum mindset. Um, and overcoming self-limiting beliefs. Let's take mm -hmm. it. Let's take it one at a time. Let's start with self-awareness. How, how long has that been? You know, it's amazing how people assume self-awareness is <laughs> uh, where we all are. But I would say that most of us are not that self-aware. We spend a lot of our lives uh, being, as opposed to um, you know, uh, truly uh, appreciating our presence. So we just mm -hmm. exist, as opposed to being. I apologize. That's really what I wanted to say. We exist, and we're not really there. Um, so self-awareness, I think is a hugely important thing. Talk about that. What, what is, how does self, how did self-awareness enter your life and how do you practice that? Yeah. So I think the, it played a huge role in my recovery because obviously alongside the physical injuries that I had, there was obviously the, the trauma of the, the impact, the, the way in which my employment then sort of tailed off, um, the way that I, I was, I was feeling, um, you know, that probably plunged me into the, one of the biggest black holes that I've ever been in my, in my life. And I think, you know, I, I realized that it was only going to be me that was going to help pull me out of it. And as part of the, I was very lucky um, in my recovery to have access to um, some really good health care. And I got access to a lot of kind of CBT therapy and a lot of talking therapies. And I actually had a diagnosis during my recovery of something I wasn't aware of before, but that actually I've been a someone who has um, adult attention deficit hyperactivity disorder which is for me it's kind of switched a light bulb on and made sense of why when I looked back at my career history that I'd spent 18 months two years 18 months two years I get bored and move on it explained why you know I did have a classic car when I was much younger and I spent hours and hours in the garage late at night you know polishing and sanding and painting and getting this thing ready but when it was done and shiny and ready to, to roll, I lost all interest in it. So there are a number of sort of indicators which sort of what we sort of the light bulb switched on. And I realized that obviously how important my mental health uh, was for me during that year of recovery in 2020. And the things that I as a person needed to have in place to make sure um, that I had a good balance between these five pillars. So for me, good mental health comes from a combination of having good good gut health, so eating right, um, and there's an awful lot of science that goes in between the link between gut health and, and good mental health. Good physical health, and taking care of myself, having regular exercise, those sorts of things, that sort of triangle is very important. And then you add into that the, you know, the, the quality of your sleep and the quality of your social interactions, and you've got that kind of, those are five pillars. And unusually for someone with, with ADHD, I've found that having to sort of maintain routines of you know, good, good sleep health, of good um, physical activity um, scheduled into my day, of good, he, good healthy eating habits. Those are the things that I need to stay um, in the most positive mindset I can. Because obviously, as you're both very aware, you know, this journey of, of entrepreneurship can be quite a lonely one and can be quite a challenging one. 
And I think what my the realization in my recovery was that, and in the starting of my business was that one of the things that was getting most in my way was my own mindset. And I think the light bulb moment for me came around a realization. I was, I was working with a coach at the time and the realization that I was never celebrating what I deemed as minor or, or you know, insignificant successes along the way. I was always thinking of this sort of big picture future that I'll celebrate when I get the first sale, when I get the first big client, when I get this, when I get that. And that puts you into a state where you're never quite present. You know, you're never quite really there. You're never quite taking stock and of all the good things that you've done to get you up to that point. So I started something that I call an achievement log. And I usually do it throughout the day, but if not, I'll do it sort of last thing at night, which is basically noting down and taking a little bit of time to celebrate all those little things I've done during the day. So not judging my success by, like, like you judge the harvest by the amount you reap, but by the amount you've sown. So what have you done in that day that, you know, that will be a stepping stone towards that ultimate success? And that I found was a really sort of key way of me maintaining that momentum. Yes, I've got these meetings in the Dara. Yes, I've got these engagements on social media. They may be quite minor things to some people, but I believe they're really important to give yourself that positive affirmation that you're doing the right thing, you're on the right path. Whereas if you keep waiting for that big payday to arrive, you know, there's nothing to celebrate in the meantime, and it's very difficult to keep that momentum. Is that is that a part of ADHD, adult ADHD? Um, no, the, the, the particular type of ADHD that I've got, um, is more on, uh, attention deficit rather than hyperactivity. So that, so that means that, like you can't focus on something for a long time. Yeah. So it means, means that I can get quite easily distracted. So in order for me to do something, um, it won't like, I like most neurotypical brains, you know, they'll be able to see, you know, if I do this, then I'm going to get this reward in the future. Or I need to do this because there are consequences of not doing it. A typical ADHD brain doesn't work in that way. The only determinant of whether a, someone who's got my particular type of ADHD, whether they do a task or whether not, or whether they don't, is whether they're excited by it, whether they get that sort of initial dopamine boost from actually doing it. So for me, it's, it's making sure that I am in a place where every little task, no matter how mundane it may seem, I can, I can gamify it, I can make it fun somehow, so that I give myself or set myself a little milestone that gives me that little kick of dopamine at the end to say, yeah, done that, on to the next. So I have to be so sort of constantly aware of when, I, when I'm drifting off and, and not focusing on things. So how, how do you how do you catch yourself? Uh, because first of all, I, I love what you just said, all of it. I think it was. I, I hope our audience uh, absorbed it. If not, rewind and listen to this again because what Pete just said was pure gold. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, the self awareness and the pillars, and maybe even more importantly, the practices, uh, embracing mm. routines, and using them in a manner that builds yourself up as opposed to what a lot of us do, which is um, beat ourselves down. Yeah. Um, and, and you talked about overcoming self-limiting beliefs. Talk about what that means. What is self-limiting beliefs? What's an example of that in your life? And how did you, how did you overcome that? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll spare you from the, the discovery process of how I got to this, but I, I recognized in, in my, in my journey of recovery the one of the things I wasn't doing was valuing myself enough. I was constantly self-doubting, constantly had these voices, that, you know, internal voices that were driving me down and, and, like you said, not building me up. And I think it was one moment I was actually, I was on part of a program in a group of, 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 uh, of like-minded consultants I was working with. And we were going through an exercise where we went to go through the sort of successes of the last year and start to plan our future focus for the, the next year. And I realized that I was picked up by, by one of the, uh, the coaches in there that I just put, sort of put out my initial results from last year. And I just glossed over the fact that I'd managed to double my income from the year before, from when I was an employee to my first year in business. I didn't even mention it. It didn't even register to me as an important you know, achievement. Because in my mind, you know, I was thinking, look at him over there. He's got three times that. Or, you know, anyone can do this. Or I'm, I'm just lucky. And they sort of said, you know, you, 
we're not going to let you get the way get away with this. You know, you've just glossed over this massively successful thing, and you've you've, you've knocked it down. That you, know, you don't believe that that's important, or that's been a good a measure of success. So that so this self limiting belief of, of that I had was that you know I'm not I'm not worthy. I'm not you know, yeah I'm not enough. And what um, the business and results I produce are not enough somehow. And I think that's where this um, achievement log came from, recognizing that, you know, if I'm, if I'm not even celebrating that huge achievement, then uh, that's a real sort of red flag for me that I'm not actually taking stock of things that I'm doing that are positive, that lead me towards that future vision. I'm not taking enough um, credit for the good things that I, I've done during the day. So that's where this sort of daily log has come from. And I use a kind of sort of a mind map um, process for it now and sort of note it down just just as I go along throughout the day. And it does it when you when you get those voices inside your head that say, you know, you're never going to make it. You know, it's, it's you know, you're going to be another consultant that fails all these sorts of nonsense that your brain helpfully tries to come up with to keep you safe. No doubt you can just refer back to the sheet and go, no, isn't, that's not true. Look at that. Look at this. Look what I've done. Well, it's a real, I find it a real sort of daily motivation tool that, that's really helpful. I think that's awesome, actually. I mean, a, a lot of people don't give themselves enough credit for the small victories that mm. add up to to large victories. And I think that part of that is, um, you know, what you're saying here is basically assessment, right? Having a true and honest assessment of where you're at, you know, mm. a little check during the day. Uh, the other thing that I like is that you had also mentioned in your, in your pre-interview about having an accountability partner. And then yeah. that would be, that would be from assessment to application, right. To, to keeping you on task. And tell us a little bit about, about how you set that up, who that is, or, or is it multiple people? And mm. how has that shaped your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah. I'm, I'm very lucky to have met, you know, fellow entrepreneurs and consultants and coaches who are on the same sort of journey as I am. And I met one, uh, a lady called Manjeet Manadia, um, back in probably about 20, uh, sort of spring 2021. And uh, we basically set up sort of, I think, weekly or fortnightly meetings ever since then to keep each other on track. And she comes from a very different background than I have, have been. Her business is very much based on personal sales, on word of mouth. She does virtually no marketing, whereas I, rightly or wrongly, I built a business with a very strong marketing focus and, uh, you know, and, and to gain a, a larger audience. So she's a perfect partner to sort of discuss and, and challenge me on my sort of initiatives. And I hopefully I bring the same to her. And they also had, used to have a monthly uh, regular walk, a pub, a pub lunch and a walk once a month with a really good friend of mine who's also an executive coach. And again, very useful person to be very open with about, you know, the personal side of my, my journey and how I was, I was coping with things. And, you know, with her coaching background, it was very easy for her to sort of help and mentor me. And I think I helped her as well in sort of her positioning and her marketing and help growing her business. So those two ladies have been absolutely invaluable to me as, as kind of people to sound, to sound ideas against, to give me inspiration and to give me a, a sense check if I'm overthinking, if I'm over worrying about something, then they'll just have a different perspective to, to bring to the table. And I think that that's very valuable when you're a solopreneur. Yeah. You know what I love about the show, PJ? I'm mm -hmm. just, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm listening to Pete and, you know, but I, I just remind people <laughs> that Pete helps build million and billion dollar companies. Right. And at the beginning of the show, we were talking shop where right? we were talking about how you do it, and, you know, it was it was the kind of talk that, quite frankly, you'd probably hear on other business podcasts. And and then we pivoted, and we're talking about Pete the Man, and and we're getting an opportunity, and the, maybe more importantly, the audience is getting an opportunity to see that even this guy who's very accomplished, done a lot of great things, helps a lot of people, um, deals with doubt, uh, has to have a process and a way to keep. Uh, keep himself focused on his successes and his strengths. And the point of that is there's no shame in that. In fact, doing it is a massive sign of strength. Being able to uh, recognize that you are, uh, you have self-limiting beliefs to use Pete's language uh, or that perhaps you don't have the habits that you want to have. You have certain goals but your habits are uh, less than you'd like them to be. There's a, 
a book I'm a huge fan of. It's called Tiny Habits by mm-hmm. B.J. Fogg. And what's great about Tiny Habits is that they're tiny. The whole point of Tiny Habits is, you know what? Every time you floss your teeth, do something. Think about something, right? And just build that into your routine. You get in your car. This is a moment to reflect on something. And you build these habits into your life and you wind up with what we've heard Pete talk about. First, you wind up with you know business success. But much more importantly than that, I think, Pete, I hope you would agree, you wind up feeling good about yourself. You wind up mm. being able to have an impact on other people's lives and help them feel good about themselves. Mm. And I love that about the show, that we are having having the opportunity to have these kinds of discussions with people like Pete and not just about how, you know, how to build great businesses. Not that that's not important, but quite frankly, it's not as important, I think, as building great lives. Well, and the another thing that I really enjoy is the fact that we have Pete um, recorded so that I can go back to this and tell my wife, hey, I had to go on a pub crawl because Pete said, <laughs> accountability partner, and you start with a with a pub meal and then you walk. I, I did hear that as well. I must admit, I, I caught that. I thought it was extremely charming and <laughs> I would like to go on a pub crawl with Pete and with you, PJ. Of we, course. The three of us, should go on a pub crawl. What do you say, Pete? Sounds you like a plan. Oh, yeah. yeah. right. I love that. <laughs> Down anytime. <laughs> no, that's so, me. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to maybe take us back to, um, you know, to business for a second. And I, I appreciate your, your, your vulnerability and transparency. I think that, uh, that it's going to be very appreciated by the audience. Um, You've also managed to to build a great company and do it quickly. Uh, you've you've ten x your followers on LinkedIn, um, and um, and you do it with a you know what you call educating and informing rather than selling. Um, again, I I, the, I I would imagine that the majority of our listeners are are not working for Apple or Google, and 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 so they're looking at way, they're looking for uh, good ideas for how to build their businesses on shoestring budgets. Um, talk to us about this. Would I believe is a uh, relatively inexpensive way uh, to build your business, which is through educating. Um, And I know that's something you're a big believer in. Tell us how you've done it and uh, maybe some lessons for for our listeners and viewers about how they might be able to do it. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I I took the decision, um, as, as many businesses should do, that the place where the majority of my audience is going to, is going to be hanging out is on LinkedIn. So I built the business almost exclusively um, on on LinkedIn because that's where my audience are. And I I totally believe that you should should pick the channels that your audience is on and master them one by one. Don't try and be everything to everyone across all channels because A, that shows that you don't really know where your audience are and B, it's a blooming lot of hard work to get good at how to communicate in the sort of the content marketing f- format on any one of these platforms. And for me, you know, there are two choices. There's kind of TikTok or there's um, LinkedIn where you can build a following based around your, the strength of your content only. The meta platforms, so Instagram and Facebook, they tend to be you know, set up to encourage you to part, to buy, part with your money for their paid ads. And then you can get an, an enormous amount of success. That's not the route that I chose to take. But the two platforms where you can build this following organically from content are either LinkedIn or TikTok. And I thought, you know, I'm a 40 something old man. I don't want to be on TikTok. That's not particularly where my audience of science based founders are. So I'll stick to LinkedIn. (laughs) And again, initially, it was quite a sort of internal challenge. You know, what am I going to be putting out there in terms of of content? Because there's this kind of misconception that you have to be putting out content that is, if you're an expert in your particular field, you have to be putting out content that is at the edge of your expertise that shows you as a thought leader amongst your peers but that's not actually the case your audience that they're the people whose sort of level of knowledge you should be talking to i think one of my american um, colleagues that i worked with a while back put it slightly um uh, tongue-in-cheek jokingly as um you know you're just a, a bozo with slightly more knowledge than the other bozos so to be confident in, in your abilities and your ability to talk to your audience in a language in a way that's natural to you. So for me, I had to overcome this sort of barrier to thinking that I had content that the people would listen to and start just testing ideas and putting things out there. And you quickly settle, you quickly can, can judge by the amount of engagement and feedback that you get 
when you're on to a good thing. And the, the two things that I tend to talk about are you know, ways in which to get closer to product market fit, ways to, to get your the right product to the right people until you get to that stage where orders are coming in faster than you can, you can make them. And the other thing I tend to talk about is fundraising. And for me, it was a case of learning the algorithm, learning how the platform works. But these days I tend to disregard that and just put out the content that I know that my audience engages most with. And it should never be, as, as you said at the start, Tell, it should never be a sort of a constant lineup of, of highly polished sales messages where each post is, is asking the audience to take some action, to come towards you that has a call to action in it. Your post should be educational. It should be getting them to think about, in the same way that I would encourage my, my clients to talk to the market about the, the problem that they're solving. I'm, I want to be out there putting pro articles around the problems that my, no, my audience is, is, is facing, getting market attraction, getting market engagement and revenue, and getting interest from investors, and putting across the insights and the different ways that I have of looking at it, and little tidbits of information they can pick up and run with without any engagement from me at all. So I kind of, I, for a while, I was carrying around this tagline of sharing the knowledge to build more unicorns, recognizing that I've got you know, two decades plus of experience in how to build these companies and that I'll freely give away that knowledge. And if someone takes that idea and they've got the resources and the capabilities and they get what I'm saying and they can run with it themselves and they can go off and be successful on their own, fantastic. You know, another great successful technology company out there. But for ones that think, geez, that's actually a bit hard. I might need some help with this. They're the people that are going to take a step towards you and will have ultimately you know, become your, your future clients. So find the topics in which you, you, you uh, around the problems that your um, solution- Less of a bozo solve. on. Yeah, the, yeah. The, that's what I heard. I, I, I got the bozo part and I, and I, <laughs> I concur. I, it's, it's quite amazing. You know, and I'll admit, I mean, I try to put content out on, on social media, including LinkedIn. And, and you're absolutely right. A lot of it is, you know, be at, at the edge of one's knowledge because you feel like you need to be cutting it you need to be simon sinek or you need to be uh, adam mm. grant uh and there's a reason that simon sinek is simon sinek and adam grant is adam grant um you know they're, they're amazing thinkers um of late I've, I've really become a huge fan of young pueblo who's who's uh not a business writer but his his stuff i think is uh well worth looking at um but yeah the point is that you know the audience that you're oftentimes communicating to has a baseline knowledge and sometimes not even that. And uh, what you know that you think is, you know, perhaps not terribly exciting is actually quite useful to a lot of people. I think that's great mm -hmm. insights, Pete. I appreciate it. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it to heart, PJ. I'm going to, I'm going to start posting mm -hmm. more things um, that are, that indicate just how much of a bozo I am. I think that that, uh, <laughs> that should help. Well, well, we all, we all have it. And I call it the curse of knowledge. Because we know we all we all have our specialized areas, and we've built up a lot of expertise and knowledge in our area, and we've forgotten because it's become daily language to us. We've forgotten how difficult that was for us to learn and adopt in the first place, and we think that you know because we know it, we've forgotten how difficult it was to learn. We think that everybody else must know it, but that's mm -hmm. our curse of knowledge. So when you find you know, that thing that you can do so well that other people look at you and goes, "I just don't know how you do that," whether it's you know public speaking or whether it's you know a particular computer program wherever it is we'll all have these curse of knowledge which are inbuilt for our, ourselves in that that combined experience that we've got and in there is probably the gem that your audience really would actually value your insights on because for them they're still looking at you and going how do they do that yeah yeah it's 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 very interesting because you know i've been in my industry for 33 years and a lot of people I, I still get comments even this past this week of people saying, wow, you know, you really, how do you know all that? Like, how do you, how do you know, you know, what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. and, and they, they seem to denote that I'm smarter than everyone else. And I'm like, I am, I am not smart. <laughs> this is, this is just stuff that I know because I've lived through it and I've, I've been through it and I learned it, you know, mm -hmm. through trial and error. And we all have them in, in multiple different areas. We all have them. Yeah. So Pete, I, uh, I want to shift to another really fascinating thing that you said. You had this interesting perspective that I, uh, I found compelling. And I think the audience will as well. You talked about setbacks as either you win or you learn. 
Mm -hmm. Um, so first I, I really, I can relate to that. Um, it's not easy. And I think you would most likely concur that being able to recognize that when you didn't win, it doesn't mean you lost, uh, that takes some work, right? So going back to the self-awareness and the five pillars and overcoming self-limiting beliefs, being able to recognize that when you didn't win, that doesn't mean you lost is, uh, is, is, is not nothing. Talk to us about that. What does you either win or you learn? And uh, how do you practice that in your life? Yeah, it is an important thing, especially, you know, the early stages of, of starting your, your company, you know, to have this sort of um, appetite for experimentation. You want to try things. And those things, you know, because they, they will lead you either to, you know, a massive win where the market goes, hell yes, that's what I want. Or to something where they, where you get some feedback from the market, where you think, actually, now I can adjust my strategy. I've got some more information. I can change my trajectory slightly. So it, it's never, a, you know, a lost um, amount of effort when you've done something that hasn't worked out the way that you wanted it to. Because if you look deep at it, You'll, you'll, you'll analyze that there's a lot of learnings that come back from your experience. So one of the ones that I've, I've been doing a while now is I had an experiment a while back thinking that if you look at the process of fundraising, the way that many companies go about fundraising is something that I call it's akin to spraying and praying. Mm. So you create your pitch deck, you, you know, you, you create a business plan, you look up and, or you buy lists of all the investors you can find on the internet and you send out your pitch deck, you know, in the hope that it'll land with, with one of the right people. And the, the research that I've done in talking with hundreds of investors over the past two and a half, three years, is that it's got about a one in 6,000 chance of success. And that's not how investors get most of their deals done. It's there are other ways. It's not just from receiving a pitch deck call from a founder. The average investor receives five to six thousand of those type of approaches every year, and from them they fund probably a handful. So, I have codified a better way of engaging investors, of, of being really crystal clear on who it is you want and what they're bringing, not just their money but the, the resources, the expertise, the connections, what they're bringing to the party and how they would help you, you know, augment your company. How to find those, again, using platforms like LinkedIn and how to engage them in ways that they actually respond to, which is either through personal networks, people that they know, through referrals from people they've already funded, or the, the investors tell me that the best, in, best deals they get done where they actually get out of the office and they go and find startups that align with their view of the world. And that's those three methods account for about 90% of deals. So I codified this way of, of basically working through this list of being really clear on who you want, working out where they are, then spending as much time doing kind of due diligence on them, the investor, as they would do on you, so that you are choosing who actually gets to see, see your pitch deck and valuing the opportunity you're bringing them rather than thinking that the money that they're going to give you, that's the prize, because it's not. It's the company you're bringing to them. It's the opportunity that they can invest in your company and make you know 10 times return. That's the real prize. And when you think about your startup in that way, then you tend to value you know, who actually gets to see it. So getting back to my, my learning, I thought I put, I codified this approach in a series of, in a, in a training course with a series of implementation guides. So people could go through the step-by-step -step process to do it themselves. And that way I can put it in the market at a price point that work that is you know, less than a thousand dollars. So it should be affordable for any startup and save the months of their life in terms of chasing up the investors. But for one reason or the other, it didn't work. And whether this is because I didn't put enough marketing behind it, I don't really know. But the feedback that I got, the lesson that I learned is that many founders would much rather, you know, uh, have someone that does the, finds the right investor for them and does all the legwork instead of them. And they would much rather pay them five to seven and a half percent of the money that they, they raise as a kind of a, a bonus for the, the, the uh, technology broker, rather than go through the process of actually doing it for themselves. And that to me was, you know, a challenge to my thinkers. I thought, you know, I would have a product that would be flying off the shelf and suddenly for less than a thousand dollars, 
founders could learn how to engage investors properly and get you know an investor for their company much quicker, I thought I'd be having to beat people off with a stick. And that just wasn't the case. So the learning from that has been that, you know, that uh, isn't the, the way that people want to engage with me, but it helped me kind of codify this approach and be much more confident about that I have the knowledge of how to approach investors so that when I'm coaching and working with my clients, I can advise them on this process that I know works. So I could have seen it as a loss. You know, I put all this effort into developing a course. It didn't fly off the shelves. It didn't make me a, you know, internet millionaire. Um, but I took that learning that actually it's given me, a, you know, a, a, the confidence in, the, my, in my process that I can coach founders in and the knowledge that, you know, there will be certain founders for which, for which it is right and certain founders for which they'd much rather just pay me a lump sum at the end when I found them an investor, which isn't actually a model that I particularly like to do. But uh, that was the main learning from that experience. That's awesome. Yeah, when I was uh, when I was coaching my kids soccer, or I'm sorry, football, um, you know, I would I would tell them that, uh, you know, there's winning and then there's learning, right? Yeah. And the only true failure is not learning your lesson. Yes. Right? So you got to be you got to be self aware. You got to take taking that pain, sit in it for a minute. And then figure out what is teaching you and how to avoid it in the future. And that's, I mean, that's, you know, a very dumbed down version of what you're saying, but you know, that's kind of what I used to teach my kids. It goes uh, back to that famous quote, doesn't it? From IBM. That if you want to double your success rate, you need to triple your failure rate. Hmm. Do more experiments, fail fast, fail cheaply. Yep. Because each of them will, will get you a step closer to learning what's going to work next time around. That's the most important one is fail cheaply. <laughs> well, I, you know, since we're talking to an Englishman, and I don't know, I'm going to screw this quote up, but Churchill said something once about that success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. Uh, yeah, I've heard that one. Yes. Yeah, yes. I may be getting it a little bit wrong. We're going to get some hate mail over that. But that was about what it said. <laughs> I, th I think also Churchill said something like, um, drinks on me. So the, uh, <laughs> the last and cigars. Yeah, and cigars. So the last thing uh, that we have is I normally I like to ask one piece of advice or message that you would like to leave our audience and, and, you know, whether they're aspiring entrepreneurs or current business owners, or, you know, even just regular peeps facing their own challenge. What, what is one piece of advice you would like to impart upon them? Yeah, this is a really good question. I, I was stumped for a little bit before I could come up with an answer to this and thinking how I prepare for this. I think, Something that universally applies um, to my founders who are you know, in, the, in the, that stage where they're building a company and looking for funding is don't chase the money, chase the market. Because when you get it right with the market, the money will find you. And I think you know, that, that applies whether you're starting a, a business and trying to find initial clients. But don't go, I, I was advised you know, to switch and pivot and go for larger companies with more money to do the sort of innovation um, projects that I can run for them. But that's not where my passion is. And I would lose a lot of myself and my, and my purpose for doing what I'm doing by, chase, by just, just suddenly chasing those companies who have much more money. My passion is working for these early stage companies. And it also applies if you're a founder trying to raise funding. That, you know, don't think about the money that you're going for as a prize. You know, value yourself, your company, your idea, everything you've got so far. That's the real prize. And you want to be getting investors to be fighting over you, not be chasing them for their dollar. And the fastest way to do that is to prove to those investors that the market really wants what you've got. So chase and chase that market until you've got something where people are like, yeah, put me down for one of those. I'll put a pre-order in now. Here's my money. Take my money. When you've got one, I'm going to buy it. Because when you've got to that level of kind of closeness and alignment and fit with the market, then you've got a really powerful proposition to go to investors to say, look, here's all the evidence that the market wants what we're trying to do. All I need is this money to go and, and bridge that gap from where we are now to where we need to be. A much stronger proposition than going to an investor and saying, give me some of your money to find out whether this is a good idea or not, which... Gambling without somebody else's money is very rarely a good bet. Our um, guest today, uh, Pete Moores, um, fascinating guy. And also, you know, for for those of you that are either starting a business or um, in the process of trying to 
take your business to the next level. Pete's worked for the last two decades and has empowered hundreds of startups to unleash million and billion dollar science and tech companies. He's done it across the world. Uh, he's in London, but he's worked in North America and Singapore and over 20 countries. Uh, and he's a good guy. And, um, you know, we, we got to know him today uh, on a personal level. Uh, and uh, and I, I feel uh, honored that you chose to spend some time with us today. Uh, if people are looking to, uh, for some help, Pete, where can they find you? They can find me on LinkedIn. If you do a search for build a unicorn hashtag, you'll find me. Or you can look on my website, which is pbmconsulting.info. And I'm pretty easy to find. Awesome. All right. Well, until next time, keep braving the odds. It's been our pleasure to have you listening to us today on the Braving Business Podcast. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you both. Thank you.